The Stella Prize is one of Australia's most interesting book prizes, and on the 2nd of March, it will announce its long list. Let's discuss what it is, why you should follow it, and talk about some of the books that might make it on the long list. I guarantee you, whoever you are, that this prize will give you an Aussie book recommendation to suit your tastes. For one of a simple explanation, the Stella Prize is Australia's version of the Woman's Prize, but it really isn't. There are two absolutely massive differences. The Stella Prize is open to women and non-binary authors. Unlike the schmozzle that happened when a quakey Maisie was longlisted for the Woman's Prize, the Stella Prize only ask authors to self-identify as either a woman or as non-binary. I just think that's wonderfully inclusive and I think that's the way the Woman's Prize should operate. The second difference is that the Stella Prize is open to many different forms of writing. That includes short stories, memoirs, histories, biographies, verse novels, poetry collections, and of course, just standard fiction. It's also open to graphic novels with the caveat that there is a substantial quantity of text. It's very broad. And as if to demonstrate that, the last five winners of this award were a poetry collection, a novel, a non-fiction book, a memoir, and a collective biography. I think you can sum up the range that the Stella Prize offers nicely by three books that were shortlisted last year. Bodies of Light by Jennifer Down, just a fantastic novel written by a cisgendered white woman. Drop Bear by Evelyn Araluen, a poetry collection written by a First Nations woman. And Stone Fruit by Lee Lay, a queer graphic novel by an Asian trans woman. I always find it difficult to compare different forms of writing to one another, but I really think that the purpose of the Stella Prize is to promote awareness of various books and authors. And there's this really wonderful video on the Stella Prize's website where previous winners discuss the difference that winning the prize has made to their lives. A lot of them list the finances as the big thing. That enables them to write full time. I think that this is the perfect prize to casually follow, to look at the books on the long list and select the ones that match your reading tastes. The other just really little thing I like about the Stella Prize is that the 2023 Stella Prize will be judging books published in 2022. Nice and simple, and it means that unlike other prizes, there is no possibility of a book being longlisted that hasn't been published yet. You can buy every book long listed immediately. Well, immediately if you live in Australia anyway. 12 books are going to be long listed and I'm going to give you a 12 book prediction. Let's start with a massive Aussie memoir, Hannah Gadsby, 10 Steps to Nanette. If you don't know who Hannah Gadsby is yet, get some Wi-Fi attached to that rock you're living under. And that's probably unfair. Hannah Gadsby is an Australian comedian and she's quality. Her show Nanette was her saying fuck it to the world of stand-up comedy and writing about what she really wanted to talk about on stage. As a result, we get a conversation about bullying, mental health, gender, homophobia and art. Or rather, the strange choices artists have made historically. It's intimate, it's inspirational, and it's hilarious. To quote Gadsby, there's nothing stronger than a broken woman rebuilding herself. Another memoir I think might make it is Homesickness by Janine Mikosa. This is a really weird, intriguing memoir packed full of images of the 14 houses that Mikosa lived in before she turned 18 and the memories she has in each of these places. And this is her exploration of trauma, her finding her voice, knowing that the stories that she's going to tell will be believed for once. This uses a two-person narrative, I and Jin, which are both the author, which could be a really powerful way of exploring trauma. And lots of reviews state that this is packed full of healing humour. There's certainly a lot going on with this one, and I don't think I've read a book like that. Now, moving on from memoirs and going over to non-fiction, Legitimate Sexpectations, The Power of Sex Ed by Katrina Marza. This is a book about consent from the classroom 
to the courtroom. And it comes highly recommended by Bree Lee, the author of Eggshell Skulls. If you know anything about Bree Lee, that recommendation for this book is is powerful. Katrina Marsden has worked as a sex offence prosecutor for 10 years. She's currently the lead researcher of primary prevention at Rape and Sexual Assault Research, and she's also the president of the Relationship and Sexual Education Alliance. She is clearly very qualified to talk about this issue. Talking about a revolution by Yasmin Abadel Magid, I remember when Yasmin was in the news a lot and she was really upsetting all those snowflakey conservative idiot Andrew Bolton types for I'm not really sure what maybe being an Australian Sudanese Muslim woman and daring to have an opinion and speak it but I just remember her being very articulate well-spoken magnetic and intelligent an activist who has made her way from engineer to the television and was forced to flee Australia in fear of her own life. Yasmin has such an interesting and unique point of view. And this is a collection of essays that explore the following ideas. The difference between a public and a private self in the increasingly public-facing world. Cultural appropriation, citizenship, unconscious bias. She defends hobbies. Uh, that seems a bit thrown in, but awesome. She discusses young revolutionaries, encourages young activists, and seeks to improve our world and our concept of revolution. How cool is that last bit, hey? Let's get on to some novels now. Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Wu was published on the 1st of January 2022, meaning it's only just eligible for this award. But it's hard to see a novel like this missing the list. A relatively plotless book about a mother-daughter relationship and art that changes the idea of who the narrator is. A mother and a daughter meet in Tokyo. They visit a gallery and they spend a lot of time reflecting on their relationship prior. The book won the first novel prize awarded by New Direction, Giramundo and Fitzcarraldo, and it's certainly gained a lot of positive reviews. Sunbathing by Isabel Beach is split between Melbourne and Italy and follows one young woman as she deals with the loss of her father to suicide. She takes a trip to Italy to see her friends get married. It's quite a healing, restorative novel that tackles some big topics such as grief, depression after the loss of a loved one, and the fear of you not being enough, the regret and the devastation of what you could have done differently. Look, this is a great book for readers who just like devastating and sad books, but it's also a great book for those readers who like those low plot character portraits that are just about a point in time or a character's relationship with their settings or their friends and what they're going through right now. I think this is a very well done blending of those two sub-genres. This devastating fever by Sophie Cunningham. For the last 20 years, Alice has been writing a book about Leonard Wolf, but the novel becomes a metaphor fiction about how to live in a world that is essentially ending. The year is 2000. Fireworks are just going off in Melbourne and Alice wonders if the world is about to end. A uh, reference to the dreaded Y2K bug I assume. Obviously the world doesn't end that night but over the next 20 years Alice has to deal with environmental collapse, fascism, war, a sexual reckoning and a plague. There are two things about that description of which I'm not sure about. Firstly why a sexual reckoning is in with the other four things. Like is figuring out which door to hang the sex swing from really as bad as Putin or Covid? The other thing I'm not sure about is, is this about the real world or is it a parody? I feel like all of those things are kind of happening. Critics have said that this is a dark comedy that is literary and blends historical and contemporary timelines. Time for a graphic novel. Men I Trust by Tommy Parrish, a non-binary transgendered cartoonist. Eliza is a 30-something single mum and poet. Sasha is a 20-something directionalist part-time sex worker who has just moved back in with her parents. Awkward. The two strike up a friendship that threatens to blossom into something more, but it's unconventional, and the two are forced to question how far they will go for the feeling of intimacy. 
Critics have called this a moving work of literary fiction, and I don't often see critics call graphic novels literary fiction. If this is a story about two women, why is it called Men I Trust? This just feels like one of those books where a trans author has made a complete mockery of cisgendered expectations and limitations around sexuality. It feels like this could be really mind-opening. The other little thing that really appeals to me about this graphic novel is that it is a one-author book. I just never know what judges of a prize will make of an author-illustrator team. The funniest book I read last year is Genevieve Novak's No Hard Feelings. If Sorrow and Bliss was a romantic comedy still about depression, but had the comedy turned up to 11, if you like Aussies taking the piss out of each other, if that's your sense of humor this is your book penny is maybe 27 she is totally in love with max who is a lit bro who clearly wants to have sex with penny but doesn't want anything else attached to that including penny penny's friend beck suddenly has less time for penny now that she's in a serious relationship and penny's other best friend anna is a high achiever she's a lawyer that's going to be made a partner and even with her hectic work schedule Anna has managed to find a girlfriend. Penny's career is trailing both Anna and Beck, and her love life is trailing them too. Her flatmate Leo seems to be out having sex with just about every gorgeous girl within a 20 minute bike ride or train journey of their Richmond flat, except Yarraville, he's got standards. Penny can't even make it through a therapy session without yelling at her therapist for attacking her or having a jam stain on her blouse. People Who Lunch by Sally Olds is a collection of essays about working, not working, the need to work, intimacy, technology, money, love, labour and pleasure. She discusses polyamory, cryptocurrency, clubbing, communes, a secret fraternity and the essay as an art form, which is really meta for a collection of essays. I just love this title. It feels like it's going to be full of irony and socialist rhetoric. Last year's winner was poetry. So I think the Jaguar by Sarah Holland Batt has a good chance of being included. A poetry collection bookended by two poems, one about the moment just before death and one the moment after. This is a poetry collection, but it's also the portrait of her father's battle with Parkinson's and her grief. 67 Days by Yvonne Weldon is a story of first love, of culture, of belief, and of First Nations. Evie was raised in Aboriginal Red Firm by the Wiradjuri people. She remembers the dream times and she harbours the pain. Then she meets James and falls deeply in love with him. They travel around the land of Evie's people, swimming in the Murrumbidgee. This is a novel about the spiritual aspect of of our First Nations people. And critics have said that it is awash with emotion. Well, that's the 12 books I'm going to predict. Now, look, I very much doubt that I've got more than two or three correct, but hopefully this gives you an idea of the sort of diversity that this prize offers. This list had poetry, essays, graphic novels, regular novels, non-fiction. We have a First Nations author, a trans author, Australians from Asian and African heritage from different religions and such an array of different perspectives. If you are a woman or a non-binary person, I think you will probably feel represented by at least one author. No matter what sort of books you like, you should see something on this list for you. So tell me, do you follow the Stella Prize? Will you be following it now? What books do you think I missed on my list? What books could make the long list according to you. Let me know in the comments section. Bye-bye.